Hello, my name is Christopher Nell. I'm a fifth year PhD student working in the photo emission and bright beams lab under my advisor, Dr. Siddharth Kakare. Our research focuses on studying photocathodes and the fundamentals of photo emission in order to improve the brightness of electron beams generated from photo emission electron sources. Today, I would like to talk to you about a recent project that I completed on measuring the photo emission properties of a graphene coated copper photocathode. But before I begin, there are a few background questions that I need to answer, like what is photo emission? What is a photocathode? What is an electron source? And what does it even mean to improve the brightness of an electron beam? Photo emission is a quantum mechanical process that was first explained by Albert Einstein in 1905 and was actually the topic for which he received his Nobel Prize in 1921. Since it is a quantum mechanical process, it is fairly complicated, but for the purpose of this video, we can simplify it by looking at this cartoon. We start with a small metallic or semiconductor surface known as a photocathode and focus a laser pulse onto it. If the energy of the photons in the laser pulse is larger than a certain threshold energy, which is known as the work function of the photocathode, then electrons will get emitted from the photocathode. Now, photo emission is a powerful process that is used for a wide variety of scientific applications, but our research focuses on one in particular, and those are bright electron sources. But what are bright electron sources anyway? Well, they are a type of particle accelerator that uses the photo emission process to generate electron beams from a photo injector. A photo injector is simply a chamber that holds the photocathode and has a high electric field. When the electrons are emitted from the photocathode into this high electric field, they are accelerated away from the photo injector. We then use these electron beams to probe certain materials and observe various biological and chemical processes. One phrase we like to throw around is that these bright electron sources allow us to make molecular movies. These bright electron sources are massive facilities and are some of the most powerful tools of discovery in the world today. For example, the LINAC coherent light source at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, Center, pictured at the top, is about a mile long. And work at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center has resulted in four Nobel Prize awards. In fact, since 1939, one out of every three Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics has been awarded to people working on or with particle accelerators. Now that we understand a bit about photo emission and bright electron sources, let's dive into what we mean when we talk about the brightness of an electron beam and how we go about increasing it. Now we can all think of making a room brighter by turning on more lights or adjusting a dimmer switch, but how exactly do we make an electron beam brighter? Well, when we talk about the brightness of an electron beam, we are essentially talking about having a large number of electrons compact in a small volume and traveling in the same direction. So with that in mind, I'm sure many of you can think of a few ways we can improve the brightness. Either we reduce the volume of the electron beam, or we increase the number of electrons in the beam. And for the most part, that is correct. And to quantify this, we have two main photo emission properties that we study. The first, and typically the most important photo emission property, is called the MTE, which stands for Mean Transverse Energy. This refers to the energy spread of the emitted electrons, and it defines the volume of the beam, as well as the direction that the electrons are traveling. With the MTE, we want it to be as narrow or small as possible in order to achieve a brighter electron beam. You can think of it like an adjustable flashlight. If the flashlight is focused, then the light gets brighter and it shines on a smaller area. But as we defocus the flashlight, the light spreads out over a larger area and the brightness gets dimmer. The second photo emission property is called the quantum efficiency, and it refers to the number of electrons that we get emitted for a given number of photons. Typically, the quantum efficiency is determined by the photocathode material and the photon energy of the laser that is used. The quantum efficiency determines the so-called lifetime of the photocathode. After prolonged use, the quantum efficiency can decrease significantly and the photocathode can no longer produce the desired electron beam. I mentioned that the most important photo emission property is called the mean transverse energy, or MTE, and so lots of research has gone into minimizing its value in order to maximize the beam brightness. It turns out that there are several factors that can limit the MTE, ranging from the quality of the photocathode surface to operating parameters of the photo emission process. First, let's look at how the surface can impact the MTE. The image on the left shows the physical roughness of the photocathode, and the image on the right shows the work function variations that can occur across a smooth or rough surface. In both pictures, the arrows indicate the trajectory that the electrons will take as they are emitted from the photocathode. If you recall, I mentioned that not only do we want a lot of electrons in a small area, but we also want them moving in the same direction. 
and any effects that can lead to these curved trajectories causes the electrons to move in different directions. This can significantly increase the MTE and therefore reduce the brightness of the electron beam. One such way to avoid running into these issues is to use photocathodes that are atomically pristine single crystals. These surfaces are very difficult to achieve and typically require repeated cycles where we bombard the photocathode with high energy argon ions and anneal, or heat, the sample to very high temperatures. Currently, no photoinjector has the capability of performing ion bombardment, and so these single crystal photocathodes are not utilized despite the promise of low MTE. Next, we can look at how our operating conditions can impact the MTE. It turns out that for most photocathodes, the MTE roughly obeys this relationship where it is equal to one-third of the excess energy. But what is the excess energy? Well, simply put, it is the difference between the energy of the photons in the laser pulse and the work function of the photocathode. If you recall, I said that for photoemission to work, the energy of the photons in the laser pulse must be greater than the work function. You can think of it as paying a toll to remove the electrons. The closer you are to exact change, the smaller the MTE. Now with modern laser capabilities, we have these devices called opt optical parametric amplifiers, which utilize a collection of lenses, mirrors, and crystals to allow us to set the photon energy to whatever we want. And so achieving the smallest excess energies, and therefore smallest MTEs, is well within our control. And this small MTE comes at the cost of a lower quantum efficiency, and therefore a smaller number of electrons in our electron beam. For some applications, we can live with a, a lower quantum efficiency, and so we tune our laser pulse so that we have near zero excess energy. And it turns out that when we do that, the MTE reaches what we call the thermal limit as shown by the second equation. In this case, the MTE is equal to the Boltzmann constant, Kb, multiplied by what is essentially just the temperature of the photocathode. And so we can reduce the MTE further by cooling the photocathode down to cryogenic temperatures. I mentioned previously that after the photocathode is used for a long time, the quantum efficiency decreases significantly and the photocathode can no longer be used to produce the desired electron beam. And so, lots of effort has gone into preserving the quantum efficiency in order to improve the lifetime of photocathodes. One such endeavor utilized graphene protective layers in the photocathode to preserve the quantum efficiency and increase its lifetime. This method has shown remarkable success but up until now, no investigation has been performed on the effect that a graphene protective layer has on the MTE. It is possible that when the electrons get emitted from the photocathode, that they could scatter up the graphene layer and the MTE could increase significantly. This would make the cost of the graphene layer not worth the benefit of the increased lifetime of the photocathode. In addition, I mentioned previously that the best way to reduce the contributions to the MTE from the physical roughness and work function variations is to use single crystal photocathodes. However, these photocathodes require repeated cycles of ion bombardment and annealing. Any ion bombardment performed on a graphene-coated surface would destroy the graphene layer, and hence, such surface preparation techniques cannot be used. Therefore, it is unknown if single crystal surfaces can be achieved with a graphene protective layer. And so reliable MTE measurements are necessary to complete the investigation into the effects that a graphene layer has on the photoemission properties. Since photoemission is a very surface sensitive process, we want to ensure that the last layer of atoms is free from any oxygen or foreign particles. In order to ensure that, we perform our experiments in ultra high vacuum chambers like the one shown here. Ultra high vacuum is a term that refers to the pressures that are about a trillion times smaller than the atmospheric pressure that you are feeling right now. What this does is it significantly reduces the number of stray particles that are present inside the chamber so that our experiments can be performed on a contaminant-free photocathode surface. In order to perform our investigation, we loaded the photocathode into our electron energy analyzer. It is a unique electron an energy analyzer that has the sample arranged in a parallel plate configuration with the detector. The detector measures the positions of the incoming electrons as well as their time of flight and from that, the MTE can easily be calculated. It also has a liquid helium cryostat connected to it, which allows it to be cooled down to 35 Kelvin, or roughly negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. This electron energy analyzer actually holds the world record for the smallest MTE ever measured, which was 5 milli electron volts. This represented 100 times smaller MTE than what is typically used in photoinjectors today. The electron energy analyzer also has a section for surface preparation that has the capability of performing argon ion bombardment and high temperature annealing. But remember, we didn't want to perform any ion bombardment because we did not want to destroy the graphene protective layer. 
So instead, we annealed the photocathode at 345 degrees Celsius for three hours. This step is necessary to remove any surface contaminants that may be present on the photocathode from its time before it was in an ultra-high vacuum. In order to perform the MTE measurements, we used our ultra-fast laser connected to an optical parametric amplifier. This allowed us to measure the MTE and quantum efficiency for a variety of photon energies. We also have a liquid helium plant connected to a helium recirculation line, which allows us to make continuous measurements at cryogenic temperatures without ever running out of liquid helium. All of this was necessary to see if we can measure the lowest possible MTEs that can be achieved with non-graphene-coated single crystal copper photocathodes. Our measurements for MTE and quantum efficiency were collected for three different temperatures. 300 Kelvin, which is just room temperature, and then the cryogenic temperatures of 100 Kelvin and 77 Kelvin. We plotted our results as a function of the excess energy, which, if you recall, is simply the difference between the photon energy and the work function of the photocathode. Looking at the MTE plot, and in particular the small inset graph, we see that we were indeed able to measure very low MTEs. The blue data point, which represents the room temperature measurement, shows a smallest MTE of 25 milli electron volts at negative 0.1 electron volts of excess energy. This is the thermal limit at room temperature and therefore the best possible MTE we could achieve. You will notice that at negative 0.1 excess energy, we don't have any data points for the red and green cryogenic measurements. At these low temperatures, there wasn't enough signal with respect to the noise to perform an accurate measurement. At zero excess energy, we see that for the cryogenic measurements, the MTE is well below 25 milli electron volts and actually reached a minimum of 9 milli electron volts. While this isn't the record 5 milli electron volts that has been previously measured, that measurement was performed at a much colder temperature, and we suspect we could achieve the 5 milli electron volts if we were able to cool the sample down to the same temperature. Unfortunately, some issues with our liquid helium recirculation line occurred, and so we could not reach those low temperatures without the risk of losing all of our liquid helium. The quantum efficiency measurements were as expected, and they had been pre performed in detail previously, so there isn't anything new we could report on that. Lastly, we collected a low energy electron diffraction, or lead pattern, shown here, as well as an Auger electron spectrum. The lead pattern allows us to observe the quality of the crystal structure, while the Auger spectrum allows us to determine the purity of the sample. Our results show that we have, what we have is indeed a contaminant-free single crystal photocathode with a good protective layer of graphene. All in all, we were very happy with our results. We were able to demonstrate for the first time that a graphene protective layer does not negatively impact the MTE, and the low MTEs in the lead pattern gave us, some gave us an additional surprise. We were able to achieve an atomically pristine single crystalline surface without the need for argon ion bombardment. If you recall, I mentioned that although single crystal photocathodes are very promising for the low MTE, they aren't used in photoinjectors because they require several cycles of ion bombardment and annealing. And since no photoinjectors have ion bombardment capabilities, and adding such capabilities requires significant and costly modifications, Single crystal photocathodes have not been considered as realistic candidates for operation. Our results show that not only does the graphene protective layer increase the lifetime, preserves the low MTE, and it allows low MTE of single crystals to be achieved without this intense surface preparation. This is a remarkable result and points to a path where these single crystal photocathodes can be utilized in photoinjectors. As a final remark, I would like to acknowledge and thank my advisor, Dr. Siddharth Kakari, as well as my collaborators from Los Alamos National Laboratory and Kyushu University, in particular, Hisato Yamaguchi and Nathan Moody. I would also like to thank the Center for Bright Beams, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy for funding this work. And most importantly, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to watch my talk. I hope you all learned something about photo emission and bright electron sources. And if you enjoyed the talk, please feel free to comment on this video or connect with me if you would like to learn more. And keep a lookout for our paper titled Near Threshold Photo Emission from Graphene Coated Copper 110, which will be published soon.